There was something, um, I don't know whether any of you have watched it, but the television program that was about the Victorian period and the Edwardian period in the market town in Shepton Mallet. There was a telling phrase in that, I think is in, no, it wasn't in last night's, it was in the night before, when 70% of the household budget was actually spent on food. Now it's only 10% of the household budget is spent on food. So food is very readily available. We don't have to work very hard to get it and it's actually much cheaper now than it's ever been. It comes to us processed, packaged, and delivered. We don't actually need an awful lot of skill to actually consume it. We don't need a lot of skill to prepare or indeed serve it. And we have it available to us for consumption on the basis of 24-7. Now, what I then tried to do was to say, well, OK, if that's how pub the public perceive food and society perceives food, how are we, as public sector caterers, perceived by not only society, but also the political classes and our politicians? And I would suggest to you that, again, there's some very strong similarities between the way that society might view food and the way that politicians might view public sector catering. It's readily available and has been for a long time. There are many of you, in, all of us in this room, are involved in it in one way or another. We all belong to associations, to particular professional bodies, to organisations that promote public sector catering. It has been, and as Mike's already said, there will be commercial entities, commercial private companies, who are looking perhaps to supplant your roles in public sector catering. Because, so the provision, if you like, the delivery and supply is readily available. As a politician, I wouldn't have to work very hard to get it. I might just put a notice in the paper and put these things out for tender. So I there's not a great deal of effort involved in changing the way that we think about public sector from a political point of view. They view it as being cheap, probably cheap at the point of delivery and cheap at the point of consumption. As far as politicians are concerned, I think they look at it as being the same, processed, packaged and delivered. And it's available readily on a basis of 24-7. But when we start to look at that in the context of the complexity of standards that we, we have as caterers, we tend to have all of these types of areas, if you like, if you want to take them apart and look at them in detail. All of these different factors or components of what we actually offer. Um, and we tend to deliver technical standards in all of those regards. We have specifications. I can recall being involved in trying to write a contract specification for sandwiches back in, nine, in the mid-1980s. Now, actually, writing a technical specification for a sandwich compared to what the soldier was prepared to consume were one and two completely different things. But we're, our focus was on designing technical standards so we could hold contractors to account over them. It wasn't actually designed to see whether the soldier was going to ever eat this damn sandwich. And in most cases, they didn't. Not unless it had corned beef in it, anyway. But all of, we've, we've spent an enormous amount of time looking internally amongst our, at ourselves and with ourselves, at focusing on the notion of developing standards in all of the separate facets and activities that we do. And we've often done it at the behest of or because we have a particular client that is demanding these types of things. In my case, it was the Ministry of Defence. In your case, it could be the NHS, it could be the university sector, local governments, and so on. But there was an expectation on the part of the client that you would come up with something that allowed them to measure. But what all of this did was actually forget what I consider to be probably the most important factor. And that, of course, is actually the consumer. Nowhere did we establish a standard that was going to be ac the acceptability to the consumer. So if we look at those things, when we talk about, and just to try and bring them into some sort of summary, we've got all the technical standards that we could possibly wish for, and probably many more besides. We have a number of operational standards. We have delivery standards. We have holding standards. We have process standards in terms of the types of cooking processes that we are going to be using and so on, packaging materials. We have service standards in relation to 
the point at which we put the food product in front of a customer. We have nutritional standards that we have to abide by, that we build into the whole of our planning and operational processes. But I'm not actually convinced that we have acceptability standards that actually changes the way that people think about the service and the food that we actually offer. Because what we're missing for me, and I may be, I'm being quite deliberately provocative in this, is these things. We're missing the notion of consumer acceptability. And I'm sure you will have a whole raft of stories of your own about, well, yeah, we try and encourage the customer, we're trying to, we do provide what the customer is asking us for, but often something falls down somewhere along the way. Um, and I can think of numerous stories of my own about why actually it wasn't in my best interest to get every single soldier to eat every single meal. In fact, I was delighted when 50% of them went away for the weekend, or preferably 100% of them went away for the weekend. And that had got nothing to do with either my staffing costs or the resources I actually need to be there. It just meant, because I had a figure, one sum per man per day to feed them on, if the guy didn't turn up, I still got the money. So I could use that money to best advantage by actually producing a higher quality of product for those that did turn up. My ideal situation would have been to have producing fantastic meals for 25% and the other 75% went somewhere else. So it wasn't actually in my interest to get everybody to come for every meal because I couldn't afford it. So we used to pr provide deliberate strategies for suggesting to people they might want to go somewhere else for some of those meals. But that's a ridiculous situation to actually be in. But that's the situation that I was facing throughout virtually the whole of my career in there. But we never ever looked at the notion really of what's acceptable to the consumer. The idea of the quality perception that consumers have, not just of the product or the service, but how do they value public sector catering in a general way? What's their expectations in terms of the service quality? And obviously there's nutritional expectations in there as well. So I've come up with this little matrix in terms of how I believe that the public and society in general views public sector catering. And I want to draw, in order to put public sector catering in its place, I'm going to draw on some other examples. Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs. I don't think people think too highly of them. They don't necessarily value them in quite the same way. If we look at the fire service, I think people value them for the personal service that they provide when they need it. And they think that they provide a very high value service to society as a whole. If we look at something like arts funding, I think, yes, actually people might value arts funding, but from a personal point of view, they wouldn't necessarily see that that had a particular value to them. So where does public sector caterers come in all this? Well, I think they come about there. That when at the point of consumption, when people are, best, are needing that service, they may ha it may have a value to them. But as society as a whole, in terms of quality and value, I don't think we see it in quite the same way. Because I think that what we're looking at is what I call a perceptual gap. If you look at public sector, sector caterers have a perception about where they're delivering their product, but the consumer has a perception about the receipt of that product. And that's what I call the gap of misunderstanding, the bit that sits in the middle. And what we've got to try and do, of course, is try and change that gap so that we align both our perceptions of what service that we provide with the customer's perceptions of the service that we're actu they're actually receiving. And if we can do that, then we can get rid of the gap. Now, why is that important? Well, I think it's important because we need to improve the perception of public sector catering as a whole. And I'm back to my motorbike, which means I'm almost finished. We need to focus on the emotional value of the, of, of the service that we offer. We need to focus on the service value, not the product, but the value that that actually has emotionally to the person who's actually consuming that product at that moment in time. We have to, this whole notion about focusing on emotional value is a fairly new area as far as food is concerned. But actually food is one of the, the most emotional experiences that we have. 